So we will spend uh, 25 minutes or so in a meditation. So what I'd like to do is to invite you to do what you need so that you can feel comfortable for these next 25 minutes. And if that means getting more cushions or more blankets or something under your feet, for people on Zoom, please feel welcome to do what you need to do to be in whatever posture is supportive, whether standing, whether seated or lying down. And I just want to invite, uh, if you are seated as, as I am, just to take a couple of moments and locate the top of your hips and gently rock back and forwards on your sitting bones. And when you rock forwards, you might notice that you are pulling forwards. Your, your stomach muscles are resisting that pull. And when you rock backwards, you're also resisting being pulled too far back. And then just let the rocking come into smaller and smaller arcs. So that it continues very, very subtly. Your spine is elongated and the rocking continues over your sitting bones in this microscopic arc of forwards and backwards with the in and out breath. And you're welcome to keep that rocking alive throughout the entire meditation if you find it supportive. Rocking is something natural to settling our nervous system and calming. And there's no need to stop that. The encouragement, the invitation is to allow it to continue. And so just bringing attention to your spine and without any will, just notice if bringing awareness to your spine and the vertebrae of your spine naturally allows an elongation, an alignment, an uprightness. So what we're aiming for is something that is deeply relaxed and yet allows our attention to be alert. We're wanting to relinquish or let go of striving or forcing. And bring an open, loving, non-judgmental awareness to the present. And the invitation is to relax your eyes and behind your eyes. Relax the smiling muscles. There's no need to put on a face or impress anyone or be anybody right now. Relax your chewing muscles and your jaw. Allow your tongue to rest in the lower part of your mouth behind your lower front teeth. And notice what happens when you do that. Relaxing your neck. And just let the shoulders relax a tiny little bit more. Relaxing the muscles along your spine, around your shoulder blades, around your mid-back, around your lower back. around your sacrum and your legs, moving down your legs to your feet and up the top of your feet and the front of your legs to your hips, feeling your belly in your lower abdomen. Feeling your belly in your middle abdomen and allowing your breath to fill up your chest.
So we can take a couple of deep cleansing breaths, bringing in new fresh air with the in-breath, relaxing, releasing, and letting go with the out-breath. Remembering you can continue that very slight rocking on your sitting bones. Synchronizing with the in and out breath. And if you notice that you're feeling unsettled, if it feels supportive, you can put one hand on your heart and another on your belly. Just have the extra presence and pressure and weight and warmth. Sitting, breathing, rocking. With an open, loving, non judgmental awareness, open to what is kind. Gentle, present. And if you hear noises from San Francisco or your own home environment, just notice your attention moving to the sound. Come back to the touch the rocking, and the gentle in and out breath. If you're tired at the end of a long day, it might help to pay particular attention to the in-breath, the inhalation, the inspiration, the revitalization. If you're in a lot of discomfort or feeling a lot of stress, it might help to pay particular attention to the out-breath, the release, the letting go, In this pray, the breath can be a medicine for our practice.
For these last few minutes of the meditation, just check and notice what's happening with your body. Are you tight? Are you contracted? Are you hypervigilant? And what happens if you bring a loving, gentle, non judgmental mm -hmm. awareness? To your spine to your breathing, to a gentle rocking.
So take a couple of stretches and squiggles and move your body. We had the motorcycle accompaniment with the bell, <laughs> which was very generous of San Francisco. San Francisco can be generous. So tonight I want to talk to you about the integrated meditation program. But before I launch into the nuts and bolts of that, I want to talk story. Talk a little bit about my own personal experience and why why this has relevance for me personally and why I think it might be of interest to others. I uh, was a Buddhist nun altogether for 28 years, including two years as a postulant in uh, a very prestigious, upright tradition that was world renowned renowned for its excellence in meditation, meditation instruction, and integrity. And I was passionately involved in the practice and in the lifestyle. And as nuns, we had um, challenges because the tradition didn't easily accommodate us. We were kind of an exception. And after many years of effort of getting every single bit of ground and autonomy that we had, all of a sudden it was reversed without any conversation, without any discussion. It was just kind of rolled back eight years from where it had been. And the whole process was profoundly distressing that your your rights, your capacity to make choices, your ability to uh, have an impact on your lifestyle, 
was not in your hands as somebody else was making those choices and there was no interest to know the impact of all this, how it was gonna land. So it's a very complicated story and it's not something that I actually have talked about very much because I couldn't find a way to speak about it in a way that had any use, you know. So I left that formal affiliations with that tradition and I continued living as a nun in the United States for many years until I returned to civilian life in 2017. But the whole process of what happened and what happened to me particularly was so disturbing that it caused a massive crisis of faith. How is it possible? You can have a group of people who are dedicating their life to harmlessness, to the ending of suffering, to upholding integrity, and cause that amount of harm to their own community members and have no interest to acknowledge to be accountable or to repair. So I lived as a nun holding this crisis of faith without having an answer to it until when I stopped being a nun, the crisis of faith continued and I continued being a meditation teacher. So I'm gonna put more context about my own personal story and then come back into the same point. So I have been meditating since 1979. It's close to 45 years, okay? And in the time I was a monastic, so from the very beginning, I was going on 10 day retreats and I had a daily practice. So I wasn't a occasional meditator. I was deep in from the get go. And as a monastic, one of the real gifts and the blessings of being a monastic is the immersion in the Dhamma and in opportunities for intensive practice. And so living in the monasteries, every single year, we had a three month retreat in the wintertime, a month of retreat in the summertime. We had 10 day retreats throughout the year. Every two weeks, we had a meditation vigil that was 10 hours long. And every single day during the regular part of the year, we meditated three hours a day. That was our life. Okay. But with all of this meditation and with the liberating insights that came with the practice and the teachings, I would come back to a core belief that there was something about me that was fundamentally bad, a kind of sense of unworthiness and a level of fear that I couldn't shake. Even though I could speak about and I knew with intimacy the qualities of freedom in the mind and what a sense of refuge is and how to access it. And so about 15 years ago, I started studying attachment theory because I had a sense that there was some way in which that would be part of why all of this was going on for me personally. And I was fascinated to learn that Attachment in a psychological sense, it's the same word, but it has a very different meaning from attachment in the Buddhist sense. The Buddhist word attachment is the kind of unwholesome grasping to desire and to aversion, which is the absolute cause of our suffering. And so in Buddhist language, when we speak of attachment, it's the thing we want to lessen. It's the thing we want to get rid of. It's the thing we want to find an antidote for. 
it's the source of all of the suffering in our own personal lives, and it can be traced as the source of the suffering in the world. But in a psychological sense, attachment is the bond that you have with your primary caregivers. And when you have five basic things when you're growing up, which is protection and support, protection and safety, attunement, soothing and comfort, delight in your being you, and encouragement to both express yourself and explore, then those five qualities, when there's enough of them, it means that you grow into being somebody who's competent. You feel safe. You feel comfortable to explore. And you tend to gravitate towards relationships where those are the kinds of things that happen in those relationships. When those qualities are not met reliably enough, which is like 30% of the time or, or less or more, you know, it's not 100% of the time. It's like 30% of the time. Then what happens is the attachment formation responds to the absence of those basic needs getting met. And the attachment ends up being one, it's called dismissive where we tend to be unable to feel the things that we're feeling or anxious, where we feel a basic sense of lack of safety or lack of trust or disorganized, where we have both of these things happening together. So our attachment formation that happens from our caregivers is incredibly resilient there's a 70% chance that the attachment formation that your great-grandmother had is the same one that you have. There's a, a 70 or 80% chance that the attachment formation you have when you're six months old is going to be the same attachment formation that you have when you're 80 years old. And there's a high probability that the attachment formation you have is the same one that your children will have. So it's passed on. And so even though we can have meditation, which is profound, and we can have insight into the nature of our mind and the nature of reality, for many of us, it does not shift our attachment strategy. And the attachment strategy has everything to do with our core beliefs, it has everything to do with the way we perceive ourselves and perceive the world. It has everything to do with whether we feel basically okay, basically not okay, basically safe, or basically unsafe. So I went into meditation with a very powerful aspiration and what I can see in hindsight is that there was a mixture of motivations that was taking me there. And one of the motivations was an unconscious desire that the liberation that I would experience from meditation would help resolve the suffering that I experienced that I had no language to describe. So in my journey, of meditation, I've also had a journey of understanding different kinds of trauma. And this category of developmental trauma or attachment wounding is one kind of trauma, though the word trauma is not technically accurate. It's only really considered attachment trauma if you have a disorganized attachment strategy the dismissive or the anxious attachment strategies in a clinical environment would not be considered an attachment trauma. But that's not something we need to worry about. So there's many other kinds of trauma. There's situational trauma, which is the stuff that we actually live through. There's epigenetic trauma, which is the stuff that gets imprinted on DNA from our ancestors. 
There's vicarious trauma, which is what happens when we're with somebody else who is processing trauma, where we get activated by what's going on in the news. There's compound trauma when we have more than one of these. And then there's systemic trauma, which is stuff that happens by the way cultures create laws. And, and we can see that in some demographics, it's easy to have many of these happening at the same time. So women, BIPOC people, LGBTQ plus people, people who are Muslim, who are Jewish. There's many opportunities for these many different layers of these traumas to be present. So, and that has been my journey is understanding these different layers and helping myself to resolve them. When I came into understanding this whole body of a work of attachment formation and attachment repair, and then I started to do my own attachment repair work, I was astonished that in a relatively short period of time, I saw very significant changes in terms of my own baseline around how I viewed myself, the level of safety that I experienced, my uh, ability to relax, and my capacity to imagine certain kinds of healthy living situations. So when I started the uh, my own personal attachment work, I was very explicit with my mentors that I was intending to roll out my own program. And the reason why was because what I was perceiving was something that was coming from a framework that didn't encompass some of the things that I know. And one of the things that I know is that as communities, we can learn to be a support for each other we don't only need to have support from a teacher or a mentor. The other thing that I know is that nature has been an ally and a support for me since I've been a child. And so that we don't only need to find support from humans. We can find support from the ocean and from rocks and from trees and from animals. And so I was interested in bringing this body of work into a context that moved it out of a psychotherapeutic domain and turned it into a context for meditators. So before I go into the integrated meditation program in more detail, I want to wrap back into the story about the monastery and about multiple traumas. One of the things about having these six different kinds of trauma, when we don't have our attachment trauma repaired, is, is that we have a baseline often where we do not feel safe. And it's often the case that we are living in what is technically called a faux window of tolerance, meaning we think we're calm, but we're not. We're living with stress and we don't even notice it. And sometimes we're so effective that our teachers don't notice it, our therapists don't notice it, our family members don't notice it. And so we don't do what we can to relax because we don't know that we need to. When we're not living from a place of safety, it makes it a whole lot more complicated to deal with any of the other traumas that we have in our system and release them. And conversely, when we do feel safe inside of ourselves, it's like the difference between swimming upstream and swimming downstream in terms of trauma release and repair. 
So for those of us who are dealing with compound trauma, when we can attend to the attachment trauma that we have, it sets the stage for us to be able to release the rest of the traumas with considerably less effort than we, we do not. So I have been sitting with this crisis of faith for all of these years around how is it possible that a monastic community that is dedicated to awakening, committed to harmlessness, can cause such an enormous amount of harm on its own members, not acknowledge it or repair it. And what I have come to understand is that the longing to belong supersedes the aspiration to awaken. And when we come into a monastic community or any spiritual discipline, hoping, and for me it was utterly unconscious, that the spiritual insights and liberation was going to address the pain that was even before I had language to describe it. We are exceptionally vulnerable to our longing to belong. And that can catapult us into doing things that otherwise we wouldn't do because what the group is doing or what the senior person is doing is something that we feel more inclined to support than speak up against for risk of not belonging. But what is also true, and this was also something that was heartbreaking to me, is, is that those of us living in the community who are on the downhill slope of the power distribution would turn around and do exactly the same thing to others who were in the downhill slope from us. And so until we are able to see the way this stuff operates in ourself and release the mechanisms of it, we are absolutely able to contribute to the traumatization of others because we have not released the trauma in ourselves. So when I see this now, there's a kind of sense of, oh, okay, now I understand. And it makes me feel more it gives me perspective about some of the things that I have lived through personally as to why some things like that happen. And so I don't feel the same crisis of faith that I had before. So the integrated meditation program is a six month program that's gonna be entirely online. And it is designed for meditators who have had at least three years of meditation experience. It's going to be based in a model that has big group teachings, small group practice session, peer group, and one-on-one -on -one sessions with somebody who's trained. And it is going to include the three pillars that I used in my own attachment repair work, which is collaboration, mentalization, and the ideal parent protocol. So collaboration in a psychotherapeutic context is the collaboration with the psychotherapist. But in this context, it's going to be this collaboration with the meditation teacher and your peers. So the aim is to find a way for peers to support each other so that the support is not only happening with the one-on-one -on -one sessions. People will have much more access to finding ways to support themselves and each other. The mentalization is a psychotherapeutic term, which really is about meditation. 
It's about the mind looking at the mind. It's about observing the thoughts and the feelings that we have in a non-judgmental way, seeing them for what they are, and looking at them through certain lenses so that we begin to be discerning to increase thoughts and views and beliefs that are wholesome and skillful and positive, and to allow thoughts and views and beliefs that are unwholesome to diminish. And the ideal parent figure model looks at imagining ideal parents that bring exactly the qualities that you need. And so when we were in a situation with our primary caregivers where the parents didn't really get us or see us or know us, then in our ideal parents, we see them as being absolutely spot on attuned. They totally get us. They totally see us. They totally celebrate us. And they do it in a way that is exactly what allows us to feel comfortable and confident and relaxed. And because they're imagined, we can have them with us anytime we want. And because for myself, nature has been my primary ideal parent since the time I've been two, I have amalgamated the ideal parent as human and the ideal parent as nature as a way for people to find multiple supports that work for them so that there's this feeling of being in a blessing field that is supportive and attuned rather than having to figure this stuff out on their own. So I am excited by this program because I think it has a tremendous amount of potential. And I'm excited to move it out of the psychotherapeutic context because I would love more people to have access to it than people who have access to clinically trained psychotherapists who are trained in this method. And because this impacts our physical health, our self esteem, our core beliefs, our relationships, our capacity to metabolize stress, our resiliency in, and our, our ability to release other traumas that are in our system, the impact is rather vast. And in our world right now, with the nuttiness and the insanity and the cruelty and the lack of justice and the lack of skillful governances that are happening, for me, there's more and more need. This is more and more pressing that we do this. We do this for ourselves and we hold the space that makes it possible for others to do that. So the program is starting in January. And if you go to the awakeningtruth.org website and you look at the integrated meditation program, there's more information about it. And if you are interested in applying, there's an application form. And there is going to be quizzes that you need to take and an interview that needs to happen. So this is not just anybody sign up. This is something where we're wanting to be careful that what we're offering is a good match for the people who are going to be joining. Part of that is because I'm not clinically trained and I want to make sure that I am within my confidence level. My colleague who is working this with me is clinically trained and his entire practice has been devoted to attachment repair work. And I feel hopeful that this actually can help people shift things that meditation hasn't changed. So when there are patterns or belief systems or um, baseline levels of stress that meditation practice hasn't shifted, the premise of this program is that this is designed to help deal with that, to shift that. 
So that's a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> a lot here. And so I'd like to pause and invite impact, invite questions, invite invite you to say, share what you want to share. So for our, our Zoomies, it will help me if you electronically raise your hand. It'll make, help me see who is wanting to ask a question. And then we can call on you. And then for you folks here in the room. I can ask a question. Please, yeah. Uh, you said that your program is more for experienced meditators. For people that are earlier on their meditation journey, do you have any practices that could also you know, apply to this attachment theory and attachment healing as well that are maybe for folks that are less experienced? So for our program, we're looking at people who've been meditating three years or, or longer. Can you repeat your question? I'm going to say okay. Something. The question is for somebody who doesn't have, who isn't experienced uh, as a meditator, what would I recommend to do with attachment and to help with this? I think what I would recommend is um, Zach Bean has an online program for attachment, which is the first level of learning about the theory and the practice. And I think the more you understand the theory and the practice, the more that's going to help you understand why things are the way they are. Because oftentimes what happens is that we think that there's something wrong with us, or we think that the meditation isn't working, or we think that if we just did it longer or tried harder, it would work. But actually what can be happening is, is that we're up against our attachment strategy, and those are extremely resilient. So the more we have a basic understanding what about attachment formation and strategies and how they work, then I think that will be a big support. When I say this, what happens for you? I think that makes sense. <laughs> they say you've got to know what the problem is to start addressing. That's right. That makes sense. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Tia, I see your hand is up. Yeah. Um, could you, I, I feel like I heard you say that there were five attachment things that happen in with parents in the family and then later I thought I heard you say six I, am I I feel like I missed something and maybe those were the same parts and maybe they weren't the same parts but could you just touch on that again five or six and if they're two different strains or if it's just one so that makes the, sense. The, the, the... I've seen different lists, so it might be that what you're getting is me speaking about different lists and getting the numbers transposed. In one list, it's five, and in another list, it's six. But the qualities are safety and protection, and I think that's one. Attunement. Delight in your being. encouragement to express yourself as you uniquely are and to explore and a safe haven to return to. Thank you. Hi, good to see you and thank you so much for your talk. I was, I'm just so interested in kind of the accompanying crisis of faith that you say, you know, you've been going through and quite prolonged and kept teaching during it. And 
I'm wondering if the attachment work resolve that or is that separate from that? Like, I'm just kind of interested in, you know, a little bit the crisis of faith. I mean, sometimes I think of the transcendent goals and then I do think we have our personal healing to do and just how those intersect. And yeah, I'd love to hear more about the crisis of faith and how you feel like it's resolving or which components have added to the resolution. Yeah. Thank you for that deep question. That's a beautiful and rich question. I think for me, what happened is that as I was able to do my own attachment repair work and see in such stark ways how things shifted in me that just was not able to shift from my own meditation practice, then it made me extrapolate that this is also likely what was happening in the monastic container. And then if I if I were to think about my monastic siblings and how I know them, you know, I would I would I would guess, I would bet that many of them are dealing with attachment wounding. And like myself, came into a profound spiritual commitment and practice with a wish or a hope that the various different kinds of layers of suffering would release from the meditation practice. So as I saw in myself that the depth of practice that I had did not change my attachment formation, and when I saw that the particular work did change my attachment formation, and then I could recognize the that, that there was a possibility that that was also happening for my monastic siblings, then it contextualized why something that was such a massive rupture took place with so little capacity for repair. And as I could see it in perspective, it, it didn't torment me. I could make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. Of course it made sense that this would happen. And so for me, I held the crisis of faith in faith that I would find a way to figure it out without actually knowing what that was for a very long time. Mm. Because it simply did not make sense to me. It was so incongruent with the values of the community to have experienced that level of harm and have so no interest in any kind of accountability for it, or even to talk about it or to hear about it or to hear about the impact of it. It was like, you know, or to see this whole process that those of us who are on the downhill slope of harm would turn around and harm others when we were in a different power position like all of that, it seemed incomprehensible when we when I squared that with my monastic aspirations and values. Mm -hmm. But when I looked at it from an attachment formation perspective and from a trauma perspective, it made total sense. And so then all of a sudden, I was not like trying to make sense out of something that was incomprehensible. It was like, oh, of course. Of course it's like this. How could it possibly be otherwise? We are not immune. Yeah. And the piece you said about, you know, belonging kind of being such a core need that it overwhelms even our integrity at times, like we'll sacrifice our integrity for a sense of belonging, I really can, you know, and, and like you say, of course we do, because it's such a primary need for us to belong. You can't, you know, yeah, yeah, thank you. Anyway, thank you so much for your talk. I resonated with so much of what you said. Thank you. Mm. So, is that a hand up? But I can't see who that is. So, Janine. Janine. Um, I 
like to echo Tenzin and saying thank you so much. This has been this is the second time I've heard about it. I was here a couple of weeks ago, and um, I'm very encouraged to hear what you're talking about. I've um, I can't imagine going through what you went through and how incredibly disorienting that would have been. And yet, on a smaller scale, I feel like I've gone through similar things in interpersonal relationships and just felt absolutely floored. How could this be? And then when you look at it through that lens, of course, that's that's what's going on. So I'm very excited about this. I'm excited about the the broad base potential of it to bring it to more people. And um, I'm also excited about shortening the path to healing because i've been looking for that and knew it was somewhere in attachment but um the three pillars that you described sound very wise so i'm looking forward to it and thank you for bringing this forward thank you i see another hand up and i can't tell who that is anita 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 Hello. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I just went through a random weird medical experience of like 15 nights in the ICU with a collapsed lung and um, stumbled across you when I had just gotten released about two or three days, your last thing a couple weeks ago. And um, I have been trained traditionally in like a very dry Vipassana method. And so I could be really a rigid kind of practice. And um, it was just really sweet to hold myself in that space of tolerance and compassion. Mm. So thank you for that. Mm. Yes, I think that there's a lot of room for tolerance and compassion and finding ways to bring that into our practice, no matter where we feel most aligned. And I'm sorry you went through such a ordeal and I'm glad to see you speaking and talking and wearing clothing and all the things that you get to do when you're not in the ICU and and I have had some of my own share of health stuff and while there hasn't been a situation I've lived through that has been something that I would want anyone else to have gone through every single thing I've been through has been part of the richness of who I am and what it is that I have to offer and what I know. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so it can take a while to metabolize the layers of a, a health crisis of that magnitude and trust your own process with it. Allow it to inform you and to let you recognize your capacity and your confidence in the practice and the wisdom that you have. It's been lovely, that part of the process, unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. um, so many windows and doors opening up in practice in different ranges. So. Yeah, our society very much underrates um, pain and illness and looks at it as the thing to avoid and get rid of at all costs. And yet as a as a practitioner, it's a 
it can be a, a plumb line into profound insight and clarity and uh, freedom. Uh, I have had decades of practicing with it and I came into this world with a very, very strong and willful mind and had severe chronic fatigue and that helped me find another source of energy that who knows how long it would have taken me for me to discover had I not been wrestled on the ground by a chronic fatigue monster. Mm. And so there's just many blessings and yet it's, it's an unpleasant experience and there's little support in our culture for understanding the the depth of what can come when we open to it with eyes that are unwilling to categorize it by the ordinary values and views and just use it as a immediate and direct experience to what's happening now and the luminous awareness that can be present with it. Mm. Yes. Absolutely experience that. Mm. It was nice to have the momentum for my practice in the moments where the pain was too much. Like there's not a lot of concentration there, but there was still that momentum from practice of just a deeper calm and just not you know, worrying about formality of it all and just being in those little pockets and different ways to be with practice. It was really beautiful. Yeah. And seeing all of the, I think I had over 20 nurses <laughs> and just having the calmness to connect in a subtle way, seeing them as human and all of their compassion. Mm -hmm. oh, so many little beautiful layers. Well, thank you for speaking of your experience and, and, and bringing the blessings of that to each of us, that it gives us all just another possibility. And so when we're dealing with uh, physical illness or pain, to move into it as a practice opportunity, it's like all of a sudden you're in an intensive retreat situation and um, you didn't actually register, but you're there. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. Yes, please. Hi. Um, wow. So glad I um, got motivated to come down here tonight. Um, nice. And I'm so glad that you're bringing this into the world. Mm. Yeah. And um, I have a lot of questions that I think I'm probably going to get most of them answered on your website later. But go for it. Really? Yeah. Just go for it. Okay. So um, for this, this will be the first train. The first. Um, this is the first cohort. What kind of um, like weekly commitment? Uh, what what is what will that look like? It's, you said a six month program. It's a six month program. So we're going to have one big group a month. Mm -hmm. one mentor group a month. So that's uh, 90 minutes twice a month for those. The peer group meeting is going to meet every other month. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a teacher, myself and or Zach and or somebody else, depending on how big it is. Um, once a month for the last three months. Okay. Um, do you have... Um 
this all scheduled at this point? Like what when well, what days this will be happening? And so the big group is going to be happening at Saturday morning from 10 to 11:30, the first Saturday of the month. Okay. And the small groups are going to need to be scheduled depending on how many people show up and what the mentor schedule is going to look like. Huh. And the same with the peer groups. Well, the peers will figure that out themselves and the one-on-ones will be with the teacher. So the only thing that is scheduled is the big group. I see. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also looking at, you know, I, my, uh, my my personal um, knowledge of attachment theory is is minimal. I've had some exposure, and um, and there are things that line up with other things that I've learned. And and I am um, I'm in school. I'm I'm studying to um, be a counselor of some some sort. It's not really clear what I'm going to be doing at the end of all of this, but. Um, but I'm wondering if um, uh, if you see this as something that is, um, I, I mean, I'm sure I don't see how it wouldn't be, but so it's it's something for personal healing and but but it seems like it could also be something for uh, people that are practitioners, uh, med meditation teachers, different kinds of teachers, different different kinds of healers. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's my hope. Is, is that this is effective and it actually helps people in the ways that I've experienced and that that people will take this into their domains and that it begins to spread out. And I'm, I'm wondering if I can fit it into my curriculum is where I'm trying to figure out. And thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know what your curriculum is to know whether you're going to be yeah. able to fit it in. Right, right. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about that later yeah. if, if you like. But, but the mm -hmm. the... The two people that created the three pillar program mm -hmm. are Dan Brown and David Elliott. And they're Harvard graduates, clinical psychologists from Harvard. And they wrote a book that is filled with research about this program and how to use this program as a clinical tool in a psychotherapeutic process. And David Elliott, Dan Brown, unfortunately, passed away a year and a half ago. And David Elliott is endorsing this program and is very involved in supporting me, developing it, and encouraging me in this process. So, and the book that they wrote is... Um, has phenomenal levels of references in it, which is the kind of thing that credentialing bodies love. And there's a research component in this program in the sense that we don't have a research assistant to get board approval for publishing the results in a in a as a peer-reviewed journal article. But we're setting it up so that we can check and see what the impact is, both for the individuals as well as to be able to let others know and then potentially to get funding to do more, make it more available, more accessible, and do more research on it. Thank you so much. I see a hand. Is that Anita's hand still? Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments or questions or impact from this conversation? Oh, Janine's hand is up again. Janine? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just so emphatically spoke last time, and I did have one sort of Musing, um, the, the program Mindful Self-Compassion was also developed by somebody from Harvard, a part-time person there, at Chris Germer, who describes realizing at some point that he didn't have an anxiety disorder, but a shame disorder. And so mm -hmm. he's been adapting the Mindful Self-Compassion program for shame. And when you talk about that, the belonging, the longing to belonging, um, 
you you didn't you spoke about it in the positive <laughs> but um do you have any thoughts about shame disorder you know i guess with relation to to the attachment theory and how um this program may help um so shame is another version of basic badness that there's something fundamentally wrong with oneself and, and that, that, that wrong, right say that again the essence of it is that we don't belong and therefore we must be bad that's right and so when the attachment formation is anything other than securely attached we're going to have a whole host of um, various different core beliefs about who we are and that's going to manifest in every relationship that we have with individuals as well as with groups so it, when we shift our attachment formation and we shift our basic sense of ourself then we come into an experience of basic trust and basic safety and instead of trying to cover the entire earth so that we don't get our feet hurt, we put on a pair of shoes and we walk where we want to walk and we can feel comfortable doing that because we know that we're protected. So I would say absolutely. Um, my own personal experience with it wasn't so much around shame, but around badness. So even though, I, I mean... I can speak at length about loving kindness and qualities of mind that are profoundly liberating, but I would come back to this baseline of somehow feeling like if there was something fundamentally wrong with me or bad about me, even if I didn't even have a story about why it was still there and that's shifted. And so hallelujah these things shift. They're not innate. They can change. And it didn't take a hundred years. It didn't even take 15 years. It took a little over a year. I mean, it's like a little over a year. So for myself, you know, the time investment was really worth it in terms of how much effort it took for me to do this process and the kind of impact that it had. So with each person, it's going to have a slightly different look or feel or like the core value is going to be slightly different. But that's what this stuff does. And even though the interesting thing is, is that for those who are meditators, I can venture to say that there isn't anything in the program that's going to be brand new, you know, and it's just the way that it's, it's, it's like it gets the leverage and the fulcrum organized in a way where it torques the stuff that needs to shift in a way that allows it to move fairly quickly and fairly without a massive amount of effort. But the, you know, the, it's, it's a loving kindness meditation with a very particular angle to it. And it's very effective, or at least that's been my experience. And that's the experience that I have with my mentees that I'm currently working with. And it's the experience that I have speaking to my colleagues that have had the same, who are also meditation teachers. So, you know, I'm coming with a thumbs up. This stuff is effective and wanting to share it and wanting to make it accessible and available to people. But I also want to say, because it was always the case, you know, when I envisioned this program, that it's going to be a collaborative creation in the sense that I have some clarity about the basic framework and a sense of the flow and a sense of what gets going to be talked about when, but it's going to absolutely going to be involved with having people's input and feedback as to how it actually unfolds. And one of the things that's coming to mind about what that means in particular is I'd love to develop or have emerge out of this a practice that peers can do with each other. And that's going to be the group figuring out what that is. So there's a collaborative co-creation about this program. And that's just both exciting and part of the reason why it's innovative. It hasn't happened before. And part of what's going to happen is, is that we're going to figure it out together. 
you know, of what's needed and how to do it in a way that is optimal and allows a good result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And just looking at three pillars that peers is what I was looking at is like, that's the really a special part. <laughs> I mean, all of it is special in the package and with all that you bring to it, your presence and the guiding that you will do, but also just that 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 element of pro learning to provide that for others and oneself is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. innovative. That's not happening anywhere that I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah. So I am really delighted to be here. Uh, you know, Noam was saying that I was part of the beginning of the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and this is the first time that I've been back to this center, and it just feels so lovely. It feels so beautiful and well-designed and appointed and settled and supportive, and I just feel so happy to be here. So thank you for joining me tonight, for your in-person presence and your Zoom presence and your questions and your attention. And if you want to speak with me, you can find me at tanasanti at awakeningtruth.org. And if you have other groups that you think might be interested in a talk on this program or why trauma-informed meditation is helpful, let me know. Um, I'm all about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.